Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Environmental Law and Policy Center's ELPC Thinks with Professor Drew Grunewald. We'll be talking about Great Lakes water levels, uh, when they go up, when they go down, why it's happening, and what a difference it makes in terms of the Great Lakes, where we live, where we work, where we play. Uh, I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Uh, pleased that you can join us. Uh, here's what's going to happen today, uh, about a 15-minute presentation by Professor Gronwald. Uh, then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, I'll do my very best to put them together and pass them on over to the professor, who will address a number of the questions. We'll have it be as sort of interactive as we can in this sort of format in which we're operating. Um, we are going to be posting this webinar. Uh, streaming it live on Facebook. Uh, so if you really like it and there's somebody you want to share it with, you'll be able to send it over to your friends and colleagues who weren't able to join us today, right? The Great Lakes is where we live, where we work, where we play. And the fact of the matter is the science is that climate change is leading to more extreme variations in Great Lakes water levels. Over the last couple of years, we've seen much higher water levels in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, Lake Ontario. That's really affected uh, the built environment along the shorelines as well as the natural environment. Uh, this year, as you'll hear, Great Lakes water levels are down a little bit. Um, they're down about a foot. Um, we're gonna get an explanation from the science side of what's happening, why it's happening, and things that we can do to adapt and adjust uh, from Professor Drew Gronwald of the University of Michigan, uh, where I teach at the law school. Go Blue, I'm a proud alumni. Uh, and with that, uh, let me turn this over to Drew. Thank you, Drew, for joining us today. And folks, uh, please post questions you have in the chat box and I'll do my best to pull those together. Uh, with all that, uh, Professor Drew Gronwald, University of Michigan, Go for it, Drew. Howard, thanks so much for the introduction. I'm hoping you can still hear me okay after our, our intro. Um, and thanks to everyone at ELPC for helping host this event and for making it super easy to participate. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, I do have some slides for you to go along with my presentation. So as Howard mentioned, I'm based at the University of Michigan in the School for Environment and Sustainability. And I also do work over in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And before I go any further, in addition to thanking Howard and ELPC, I do need to thank colleagues I've worked with in the past and colleagues I work with now, particularly the scientists you see here on the screen are with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration where I worked for about a decade. The folks at NOAA do tremendous work to provide foundational data resources, models, uh, and other products for the Great Lakes region um, to help answer a lot of questions. And then I also need to thank the members of my current research team at the University of Michigan, including postdoctorate fellows, graduate students, undergraduates, the plots and the data that you're gonna to see today really come from their hard effort and dedication to this overall problem. And here are some of our funding sources for our work. So as a brief note of introduction before I dive into some of the science, uh, when I gave a similar talk like this last year, uh, and when I give other talks, I, it's always good to remember the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with when we talk about the Great Lakes Basin, and the fact that it's a large binational resource. Uh, in order to understand the hydrology and the climate of the Great Lakes, we essentially need to stitch together data sets from the United States and Canada. So this figure on the left from a paper we recently published sort of underscores those two points. First off, if you look on the left, you can see the international border here between the United States and Canada. I'm tracing it with my cursor, running literally right down between the lakes. This image also, reminds us that the downstream portion of the St. Lawrence River is really a, a, has a big impact on the system, particularly with regards to regulating and modulating water levels between Montreal downstream, water levels in Lake Ontario, and all throughout the entire system. The image on the right puts our basin into a global context and shows how big it is relative to the 20 largest freshwater basins on Earth. That's what's in this right-hand panel here. So, if we take a step back and look at where we were in April 2020 when I gave a similar webinar, um, we were at a point where water levels had been high and for Lake Michigan Huron in particular, 
were approaching record high levels. This is a graphic from that time period developed by the Army Corps of Engineers that puts together plausible water level scenarios. So what you see, if you look on the bottom axis here, are months of the year. The dots here represent average water levels. The black line represents observed water levels. And then these black dashes, importantly, record, represent monthly records in the historical record, monthly high records. At the time, um, this was published, which I believe was March 2020. These bars here, each colored bar, along with the gray band, represent future scenarios in case in the case of the colored bars representing what would happen if a particular year of water supply from the historical record happened again. So for example, if we had 2019 water supplies repeat themselves, this green line represents what would happen to water levels on Lake Michigan Huron for the next several months. And we would have just simply shattered water levels on every single month. These two colors represent a couple other different year scenarios, but importantly, the gray band represents sort of the full range of outcomes of plausible water level scenarios that were made at that time. So keep that in mind. That was the story we were telling at that time from uh, a water levels forecasting perspective. From a public relations perspective, the big key was flooding. Flooding was ubiquitous, in particular along Lake Ontario, where record high levels, all-time record highs, had been hit in 27 and 2019. Governor Cuomo on the right-hand side here had gotten involved as residents of New York were essentially pleading to let more water out of Lake Ontario, which ultimately would have further exacerbated flooding downstream in Montreal. This was an article from the New York Times in 2017, encompassing a lot of the narrative in the media around that time period. And then finally, when it comes to science, we embarked on a paper to try to understand what was happening, and we synthesized it in this work that was just recently published where we describe what's happening on the Great Lakes as a tug of war, in which two competing forces on the water balance are gaining strength. Precipitation, which is expected to continue going up across the Great Lakes region, is pulling water levels up in one direction, while temperatures are also expected to increase, which simply put is expected to increase evaporation off the lakes over time, which pulls water levels down. So we think it's helpful to think of these two competing forces pulling water levels back and forth over time. And we showed in this paper how those two competing forces led to such high water levels. On the top plot, you're looking at what we would call anomalies in the water balance on the land surface of the lakes. So this first plot is showing you 70 years worth of data on precipitation anomalies on the land, and you can see precipitation going up, blue bars are above average, orange are below. But then here's evapotranspiration off the land surface, water being lost off the land surface. And you can see when you look at the net amount of runoff here on the land surface, the two sort of in a way cancel each other out. There's not an extreme signal here over the past 10 to 20 years. But what we showed in this paper and what I think is important to the story over the past few years is that when you look at what's happening over the lakes, which is what is in these bottom panels that I'm showing, the bottom left here shows an even stronger signal of increased precipitation over the past decade and a half. And then the difference here, the big difference is the drop in lake evaporation over that same time period, not an increase in evaporation, similar to what happened on the land surface, but the Arctic polar vortex of 2014 really change the dynamic of evaporation on the Great Lakes. You have more precipitation coming in, less evaporation and water loss going out. The net amount of water over the lakes was absolutely tremendous and it led to the record setting surge and record setting highs throughout that time period. And the final take home message from last year, and I'm gonna continue to make this again, is all of these processes, the increase in precipitation being brought into the region, the changes in air temperature and humidity are being affected by these large air masses that can bring cold, moist air in from, say, from the maritime polar um, air masses, either from the Pacific or the Atlantic. They can bring warm, moist air in from the Gulf of Mexico, and they can even, in the case of an Arctic polar deformation, bring very, very cold and dry Arctic air. A take-home message for this story is that where we live in the Great Lakes, 
can be impacted by nearly all of these air masses that you see. The one that we really aren't affected by as much is this continental tropical air, which brings, uh, which transports warm and very dry air. There's not bringing, there's not a lot of source of moisture contributing to this air mass. So key point there that we can be affected by any of these. So here we are in May, 2021. What's happened over the past year? Well, for one thing, the narrative has changed a little bit. Uh, and the front of the Chicago Tribune in February 2021, there was a leading article about how groundwater is running out. This is not a story that is consistent with the story of water abundance. And in fact, when you look more closely, there is an important story about groundwater depletion around the periphery of the Great Lakes Basin that's really important to this overall narrative. Um, in terms of where we are right now and where I might be going forward, this is an update to the plot I showed you earlier, where we're looking again at a time period in this case from January 2018. Um, let's see here. Ah, this is the plot I showed earlier. So I'm just repeating the plot um, from last spring, but we can now look at the more updated version of this plot. So again, this time period right here was the forecast for April, May, June, July of 2020. If I advance one more slide, here is the update that was published by the Army Corps of Engineers. So now at this point, April 2020 is here on the bottom left. This black line now represents what was actually observed and the forecast throughout that period is quite accurate. Each one of these black dashes represents a month where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron set a new monthly high. They didn't break the all-time record high, but they came very close. But then what's interesting about this pattern is you can see this period of decline. This has been an above average period of decline um, throughout the winter of 2020 through 2021, getting us back down to water level conditions that are between these record highs and between the average. So if we look forward from where we are right now, which is right about here, Water levels are between the record highs and the averages. And we can again look at these plausible scenarios moving forward, indicating that um, even under very, very wet conditions, it's unlikely that records are gonna be broken anytime in the next year or two, um, but that it's also extremely unlikely that water levels are gonna be returning down to their long-term average levels, at least on Michigan Huron. The full range of these scenarios tends to put water levels in this range here where they may be declining a little bit more, um, but not reaching those record highs again anytime soon. And from a science perspective, I find this plot particularly compelling. This is a summary of precipitation data put together by NOAA through the National Center for Environmental Protection, or NCEP, NCEP. And what I'm comparing here are two winter months from 2020 in the top two panels, and two winter months from 2020 to 2021 in the bottom panel. So for example, up here, we're looking at precipitation rankings in terms of percentiles in December of 2019. And you can see across the country periods of drought, but the amount of precipitation during that time period, again, this is that what period from 2019 into 2020, tremendous period of abundance. And even into January of 2020, these percentiles here 70th, 80th, 90th, 90th percentiles for all time precipitation. We can contrast that with what started happening this past winter. Some of the lowest percentiles you can have over the Great Lakes Basin here starting in December of 2020. And then just a few months ago, an extremely dry January. That are one of the primary reasons for driving water levels down following their peak uh, roughly a year ago. So if we look a little bit further forward, I, I thought it'd be helpful for this, for this group to provide a quick commentary on the research. We have a pretty good idea at this point of what precipitation, evaporation, and runoff have been in the past. But to me, the big gap in science is being able to somehow make forecasts about continental scale changes in air masses that are affecting the Great Lakes region. In other words, what are the changes in ocean temperatures, ocean circulation, atmospheric circulation that are suddenly leading to these shifts in the amount of moisture that's being brought into the Great Lakes region? One really interesting paper I stumbled upon that's been written recently looks at the tracks of cyclones over the Great Lakes and emphasizes this point 
where they show a track of some of the major different atmospheric patterns, similar to what I showed earlier, and they emphasize how minor shifts in these essentially cyclone or weather tracks, very subtle differences of these tracks, either from west to east or north to south, just by looking at this picture, you can imagine they have a huge impact on the amount of moisture and temperature changes that are brought into the Great Lakes region. There have been studies that focus on this type of research for particular parts of the country, but to my understanding, no one has done it yet for the Great Lakes. And to me, that would be a major next step forward. Um, I finish with this uh, image of the Arctic polar vortex to show it's not just about how changes in moisture coming into the Great Lakes uh, need to be studied from a continental scale, but we also need to be to get a better understanding of how likely it is that this Arctic polar vortex might continue to oscillate and every four to six years bring us extremely cold and dry air that can change evaporation rates, change ice cover, and impact the water balance in a very different way. So with that, I'll leave you with this, this image that I like to show of the Great Lakes showing all the different complex processes that I've sort of hit upon. And with that, I'd be happy to stop and answer questions people have. Thank you again. Um, thank you very much, Drew. Um, I know there's a lot of interest. There are a lot of questions here. So folks, if you would please use either the chat box, um, I'm sorry, use the Q&A box, um, send some questions, and we'll begin to uh, get those over to Professor Groenwald. Uh, why don't I queue one up in the meantime? All right, record highs last year, leading people to say the impacts on the built environment are significant. Homes, buildings, uh, community centers, intake pipes for industrial facilities, all being fundamentally effective. You know, look at it, we got to do something. Is that the longer term trend or was that just sort of aberrational and now we're back to norm? How do we plan for the future? How do we begin adapting when we're looking at these really significant swings? Yeah, that's a great question. And that is the common question, Howard. And to help answer that, I'm going to broaden our reference period. So what I'm showing on the screen now to help answer that question is the very long historical record of the Great Lakes. So now we're looking at water levels, not just for the past decade or so, but going back to 1860. So these are direct water level measurements. Um, and when you look at this, what you realize is water levels go up and down on the Great Lakes and have for a very long time. The takeaway message, Howard, for you and for the audience that, that I and my colleagues have been arriving on is the region needs to be prepared to adapt to high water levels and it needs to be prepared to adapt to low water levels. That at this point is without question. I guess what we are doing research on and trying to find out from people is, does it matter to you if water levels in the future might stay high for longer or get a little bit higher? and then rapidly swing to a low period and stay low for a longer. This period on Michigan-Huron recently really underscores that point. We have this persistent period of lows from 1998 through 2013, and now we've had this consistent period of above average conditions. Is that gonna change somebody's considerations about building a home or commercial infrastructure relative to a period where maybe they stay at an average condition for a while and swing high or low? But the take home is that there will continue to be high water levels, there will continue to be lows, uh, and the region needs to be prepared to adapt to both. Drew, a question from Amy Buska and a couple other people as well. Why is it that lake evaporation is relatively lower, or going down, if you will, while land is going up? Uh, a more technical term that's being used, but I think everybody gets the point on this. Is that due to ice? And how does that really play out? So for example, you know, are we looking at a connection between very low temperatures which might, might cause lake freeze up and reducing evaporation from the lakes, particularly say Lake Superior, David Groman's question. Uh, how does this all interact together? Yeah, great question. Um, a lot of this has to do from my perspective. So again, again what a great, what a great question. Um, if we think about the lakes and we think about what's driving evaporation on the lakes, there are a whole range of different processes. 
but a lot of them deal with what's happening at the lake surface within a particular season. So in other words, if the lake surface temperature is warm or warmer than average and we still get cold, dry air coming over um, and, and, and perhaps uh, with, with high wind and low humidity, we, we're likely to have a lot of evaporation. Um, what, what happened in 2014 is the lakes got extremely cold. And there are some complications here with how the lakes turn over, how the entire thermal profile of the lakes might be changing. But in general, that story about ice cover, the thermal gradient of the lakes is different from what we look at when we look at the land surface in terms of evapotranspiration. Uh, and for one reason, evapotranspiration is driven largely not by just ponding water on the surface, but also by vegetation. So in a way, they are two physically different processes. Um, and from that, we see these two different responses to changes in regional temperature. Um, the cold, cold air across the region did not diminish evapotranspiration in the same way as a result that it did over the lakes themselves. The, the correct term, of course, is evapotranspiration. I was using evaporation as sort of the shorthand, having well, a hard time getting the six syllable words out of my mouth. Uh, the same sort of question, Drew, about you talked about surface level and ice. How about the lake bottom? A question from Nicole Salisbury about how does the lake bed affect cyclones, hurricanes, and other weather events? You know, you, you talk about upstairs, how about the downstairs? Yeah, sure. So there's two different parts to that question. So a lot of the tropical cyclones and extra tropical cyclones that affect our region, they originate elsewhere, um, often on the marine coasts. Uh, and those have a lot to do with the thermal gradient in the oceans uh, and the temperature gradients there and how they translate. I'm not an expert on those processes, but those have a lot to do with ocean temperatures. The, the, we just recently published a paper um, in the journal Nature Communications, Eric Anderson from NOAA was the lead author. Some of you might have seen this, CNN picked it up and it had to do with this idea of winter disappearing from the bottom of Lake Michigan. So what, what our research showed is that while there might be these changes in the surface of Lake Michigan and other lakes where from season to season, they might be warm or cold, depending on what's, what, that year, what that year's solar input was, we're finding that the lakes are warming way down at the bottom. And that is really important because one of the long-term drivers of evaporation, evaporation change is the overall heat content of the lakes. That is how much energy is in them. What we found is that is changing and it's changing a lot down at the depths. Yeah, uh, Drew, a question that was asked here by uh, Robert Rosenstein, uh, just, Think about how do you plan construction? What do we deal with the built environment? How do you do land use planning when we're dealing in much more variability of what the water levels are? It's, it's what I asked you about before. How can we use natural systems and wetlands, for example, to act as a sponge, mm. at least with regard to maybe not the very, very highest water levels, but ones that are higher than normal? And is there a way of using natural systems to maybe release some of that when the water levels are low? Right, I don't think there is, in part because the magnitude of water that we're talking about here is really extraordinary. I have a table that puts some of this into perspective um, that shows the magnitude of the water that's flowing through the Great Lakes system. And essentially what that table shows us is that we're dealing with the second highest rate of water coming off the continent, uh, second only to the Mississippi River. So the strategies that we have at our disposal for managing that amount of excess water are really beyond the scale of wetland mitigation. Um, one potential option that, that, that scientists are starting to talk about is, can we use depleted aquifers as a source of recharge. So for example, the Joliet Aquifer that was just recently abandoned uh, as part of that cover story I showed, is there a way to temporarily put water in the subsurface? Now there are a lot of issues and technology associated with that, but that's the type of scale we're talking about. Wetland mm -hmm. mitigation is great for pollutant removal and perhaps for some very, very localized um, dampening of the hydrologic cycle. But for the scales we're talking about, it's just not quite there in terms of an overall scale um, 
uh, ability to address the problem. True. Well, Gwendolyn Casey is asking a question. Yeah, you know, we've talked about Lake Michigan and Lake Huron levels, and you and I have talked before about Lake Ontario water levels being very high last summer. Why is it some of the Great Lakes, but not all the Great Lakes? Or does that simply change from year to year? Are there hydrological, are there geological reasons why the extremities, the variations in lake water levels are more, are, are happening more in some of the lakes rather than all the lakes? Yeah, another great question. So um, I'll share my screen here. And Howard, can you see this sort of water balance slide where I'm showing? Yeah, we bars? can. Yep. yep. And I know Howard, you've well. seen this. You've seen this one before. I um, but I, I think it's it's a really good way to answer the question. Um, there there is different amounts of variability on the lakes. One thing to do is to isolate Lake Ontario in part because Lake Ontario is so far below the other lakes, it, most of the elevation drop is over Niagara Falls, that um, the, the lake is not necessarily connected to the other lakes hydraulically. It also turns out that Lake Ontario has the highest degree of control through um, control structures at the outlet of Lake Ontario. So when you look at those long-term plots of variability, Lake Ontario is almost just a different beast because the amount of control that we have on the outflow of the St. Lawrence River and the ability to control monthly flows. When we come upstream, um, it's true that each lake demonstrates a different degree of variability. One of the reasons why we see more variability on Lake Michigan Huron is if you look at this plot, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the magnitudes of precipitation, evaporation, and runoff coming into each lake. Green is the runoff, blue is the precipitation on the lake, pink is the evaporation being lost. But then we come to the right-hand side, we're seeing the rate of water level flow coming into and out of each lake. And so when you look at what's happening in terms of the potential variability of Lake Michigan Huron's internal water balance, which are these three values here, coupled with the potential variability of flow coming in through the St. Mary's River and leaving through the St. Clair River, there's really just a tremendous amount of overall possibilities of water coming in and water leaving that ultimately propagate into a lot of water level variability on Lake Michigan here on Lake Superior in contrast, here is its internal water balance and it just has one outlet here. So there's a lot less room for overall variability in, in the natural range of water levels. I drew a question from David Mueller um, and this sort of gets more into the policy side, but is this sort of a perfect storm, if you will, as we're looking at higher water levels and some depleted higher lake levels most years and some depleted groundwater resources, that's gonna create pressure for more diversion of Great Lakes water? Or do you think that's sort of locked in and the ups and downs sort of mitigates against it? Uh, no, I don't. And I know that the folks at the, at the Conference of Great Lakes Governors you know, would, would hesitate to me talking too much about this, but I think it's a very practical question, which is, you know, we have the Great Lakes Compact, um, and it's been it's been challenged recently, and it's and it's served its purpose well. But I believe that looking down the road 20, 40 years, as groundwater begins to be more and more depleted, and this gradient in soil moisture and water availability across the continent changes, I believe that it's a very real question. Um, I believe the question had to do with uh, what was it a future. Um, a collision course. Um, I think it's a very practical question, and it's actually one that we're taking a look at right now, uh, which is sort of what is the sustainability of the Great Lakes Basin and Great Lakes water within the basin from a climate perspective and from a water withdrawal perspective. That's a really important question. It's one we're pursuing. Through Harry Solomon's question, how does the warming of deep water and the ex thermal expansion affect surface water? I mean, this is another variation of the upstairs downstairs question for those of us who aren't hydrologists. Yeah, great question. So just for a little bit of context, thermal expansion in the oceans is a huge deal. It's actually a quantifiable component of, of sea level rise. On the Great Lakes, from the research that I've read, I haven't done my own research on this, um, thermal expansion is a phenomenon. It's most significant on Lake Erie. So there actually, people believe that there's a quantifiable, you know, change in the volume and water level of Lake Erie, in part because it's so shallow and the volume is there, um, that it could be measured. 
one of the things we're trying to do in our research on the overall water balance of the lakes is to see if we can actually tease out the, the amount of Lake Erie's water level rise and decline each year that is just due to thermal expansion. Everyone thinks it's, it's there and it's quantifiable. The problem is Lake Erie, like the other lakes, fluctuates so much due to a variety of other conditions within the course of the year that it's hard to tease out that factor, but it's there. Scientists agree that thermal expansion is a factor and it most affects Lake Erie, but it's hard to tease it out from the other factors affecting water levels. Through Kathy Reesing's question, polar vortex, what difference does that make? How does that play with the water levels? Is it a factor? Does it make a difference? Yeah, so hi, Catherine. Yeah, so um, great question. So here's a graphic that I sort of whizzed through earlier about right. the polar vortex, but just to explain right. a little bit better, on the left-hand side, we have this, what's called this stable polar vortex, this naturally occurring pocket of very, very, very cold and very dry air. And when the jet stream is strong and stable, it contains that air. One of the things scientists think is happening is that overall global warming is affecting the stability of the jet stream, which causes that cold air mass, instead of being contained, to periodically wobble. And this is exactly what happened in 2014. And it's sort of serendipitous that in this picture, it's actually not meant to do so. No one who drew this graphic cares. I don't think about the Great Lakes, but it just so happens that this pocket <laughs> of air is, is, is reflecting almost exactly what happened in 2014. It didn't wobble all over like this, but one big tongue of air descended right on the Great Lakes. It has a huge impact on the water balance. In fact, the graph I showed you earlier that showed that sudden decrease in lake evaporation we believe what did not only coincided with, but we believe it was directly related to that huge amount of cold air that initially led to a lot of ice, but ultimately cooled down the lakes for a period and dropped the overall evaporation rate for several years. I'm gonna raise one more question with you uh, coming from David Grumman. Um, just talk a little bit, if you could, of some people may not know, there are gates, if you will, over in St. Mary's that allow control of how much water goes from Lake Superior through the Straits of Mackinac and into Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. And then there are gates on Lake Erie that affect what goes into Lake Ontario. Um, how, David Grumman's question is, how much of an impact does that really have? Is that the veritable drops in the bucket? Or is this fundamentally a way of adjusting um, water levels when it comes to Lake Ontario? And Lake Michigan and Lake Huron? Yeah, great question. So just to clarify that question that, that Howard iterated, if we look at this, Howard, can you see the map here of the entire yep, Great the Lakes map, and the Great Lakes? Yep. Okay. The map is up. It's so, uh, it yep. shows the Sioux and it shows yep. you know the uh, the canal. Yep. So just to clarify the question, as water flows out of Lake Superior, there are there's a lot of infrastructure here in, in the Sioux and Sioux St. Marie, including locks and diversions, and there is the ability to have a minor impact of the flow rate through this system that can affect how much water is temporarily stored in Lake Superior, how much drains out. The analogy I like to use, if you imagine some kids playing in a creek that's about four feet wide, and they really like to do things like line up rocks or sand on one side and watch the river kind of back up a little bit, that's sort of what we're talking about here. The main control mechanism are a series of gates that cover a small section of the river. If you close those gates, water backs up a little bit on Lake Superior, but most of it is still flowing around the gates. That's the extent of control on Lake Superior. It's essentially minimal. Really, the other anthropogenic control point in the system is the one we talked about earlier, way down here at Cornwall and Messina. That is much more significant. The project that was implemented there in the early 1960s not only widened the channel to temporarily allow more water out, but also a dam to hold more water in the Moses Saunders Dam. Um, and if I shift real quickly while maybe we, while we're transitioning to the next question, I'll show that water level slide again. Um, because if we look at the long-term water levels on the Great Lakes, you can clearly see the impact of the increased regulation on outflow of Lake Ontario. So again, here's the overall image here of the Great Lakes. And if we go down to Lake Ontario, whoops, I accidentally advanced my slide. So if we look here, here's the, um, call it, if you will, natural variability of Lake Ontario. 
And then here, after the construction of the Moses Saunders Dam, you can clearly see the diminished overall interannual variability um, as a result of that infrastructure. So in summary, a lot more control of Lake Ontario, very minimal control of Lake Superior, and really no control over the Middle Lakes here. Right, I'll, I'll tell you what, I sort of sound like the De Detective Columbo, you know, and I just have one more question. If you wouldn't mind, Drew, uh, there are two more questions posted by Mark Wagstaff and by Robert Rosenstein. Uh, they're over in the Q&A uh, dealing with the Line 5 pipeline for the Straits of Mackinac and the impact of climate change. Uh, do you want to take a run at those and then we'll move to wrap this up? Sure. Um... So we've spoken about this before and the impact of, of climate change. The, the biggest factors that I think are affecting the line five. So just here's a map here. And of course, we're talking about line five here through the straits. Um, the, the biggest concerns that, that I think I would pose regarding line five have to do, uh, well, one has to do with um, damage due to infrastructure or you know a, an object that strikes it, which doesn't really have to do with hydrology necessarily. Like the anchor strikes um, it. Happened. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So there's that whole realm of, of threat. The next category really has to do with things on what I would call the hydrodynamic scale, which has to do with circulation patterns and the very, very sudden rising of water waves. Um, that's the next order. The long-term sort of transient rise of water levels or the persistent higher persistent lows, we don't believe pose a threat. It's that it's those short-term circulation patterns in a three-dimensional scale, um, including the, the quick currents that might run along or shear the pipe um, that we're talking about. And that's a sort of a different time and space scale than what I've been talking about today, but that's the best way I could answer that question. All right, let's see if we can move to wrap this up because I know we've said to everybody, you know, let, let's see if we can focus this and give, I'm just trying to be thoughtful on people's time. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Thank you, Drew, uh, Professor Drew Gunwald, for all you do, uh, as well as for joining us today. But this is a priority issue for the Environmental Law and Policy Center. The Great Lakes is where we live, where we work, and where we play. And the impact of extreme variations in water levels, mostly driven by climate change, has a, you know, really affects the built environment along the shoreline. You know, whether it's apartment buildings where people live on the south side of Chicago or the north side, and whether it's industrial facilities on the southeast side of Chicago or the Lake Calumet area or northwest Indiana, it affects people's homes and cottages and buildings in western Michigan on, on the eastern Lake Michigan shoreline and throughout the region. You're going to hear a lot more from us about it and what that does for land use and zoning and how we really try to make sure we can live in accord with nature and use natural systems maybe to soak up uh, some of the water and release some of it in times when there's uh, not enough. So thank you for joining us. The webinar is gonna be posted almost immediately on ELPC's website and Facebook. Please feel free to take a look at it, share it with friends and so forth. Uh, we'll be hosting webinars on a variety of topics, many of those involving the Great Lakes and science. Take care, be well, and let's hope we're moving into a, fingers crossed, a better, safer world uh, for all of us. See you soon.